Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming um, tonight. As you can see, our topic will be race in our schools nationally and in Princeton. Interesting topic. But before we begin, my name is Joyce Troutman Jordan. I'm on the board of Not In Our Town, and I would like to share our land acknowledgement and mission statement with you. The land on which we are living is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lene Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lene Lenape people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in their homeland and in the diaspora. We also acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans and their descendants on whose backs the wealth of this nation was created. Not in our town's mission statement. Not in our town, Princeton, is a multiracial, multi-faith group of individuals who stand together for racial justice and inclusive communities. Our focus is to promote the equitable treatment of all and to uncover and confront white supremacy, the system that facilitates the preference, privilege, and power of white people at the expense of non-white people and pits racial and ethnic groups against each other by upholding the hierarchy based on proximity to whiteness. Our goal is to identify and expose the political, economical, and cultural systems which have enabled white supremacy to flourish and to create new structures and policies which will ensure equity and inclusion for all. In our commitment to uncovering the blight of white supremacy, on our humanity, we take responsibility to address it and to eliminate it in all its forms through intentional actions, starting with ourselves and our community. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speakers. Caroline Clark is a lifelong advocate for the underserved. An attorney for over 20 years, she has worked in various nonprofit governmental and quasi-governmental agencies, including Disability Rights New Jersey, the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights, and the New Jersey Department of Labor and Workforce Development. Caroline serves as a board member of Not In Our Town, as well as other community organizations in the Trenton and Princeton area. Dr. Simona L. Brickers is the senior consultant at Phillips Brickers Institute. She has published in the Journal of Leadership Studies and Journal of Interreligious Studies. She is an organizational, organizational leadership and development scholar and practitioner whose research and teaching focus on the inextricability between aspects of reality and perceived humanity. She studies and teaches decolonizing chronically touched and untouched the politics of leadership and education as a social and hu human phenomenon. After their presentation, Dr. Linda Dodd will offer some comments. Dr. Dodd has been a lecturer in the Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs since 2018, teaching courses on gender, race, law, and public policy. She was the Joseph H. Flom Professor of Legal Studies and Political Science at the City University of New York City College from 2010 to 2018, and was a member of the law faculty at American University's Washington College of Law from 2005 to 2010. Her research focuses on American political and constitutional development, constitutional law and theory, jurisprudence, and civil rights. I am pleased to uh, turn the program over to our first presenters, Caroline Clark 
and Dr. Simona Brickers. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. Our schools are part of the systems that compromise life in America. And like all systems, racism runs through it. From slavery to the present, from K through 12, through college. While some may agree that the problem only recently reared its head, we believe the problem recently came to a head and the race, critical race theory and anti-LGBTQ plus issues are being used as flashpoints in school board discussions about what we want our schools to look like, what we want our curriculum to look like, what we want our school leaders to look like. For us to understand that the issues around inclusive education is not new. We looked at the beginning of education for Black America. During slavery, it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read or write, as it was believed that an educated enslaved person was dangerous. And that was true. Because abolitionists writers fueled slave uprisings. So anti-literacy laws were passed. For example, in 1833, an Alabama law asserted that any person or persons who shall attempt to teach any free person of color or slave to spell, read, or write shall upon conviction thereof of indictment be fined a sum not less than $250. The fine would be equivalent to about $7,600 in today's, in today's value. And in Mississippi, any such teacher would be imprisoned for one year. And the imprisonment for the enslaved student was savage beating, and their fingers and toes amputated. So there were actual laws in place that said no one was allowed to teach Black folks and Black folks were not allowed to learn. After the Civil War ended in 1865, freed people with few resources and in a hostile environment created a system of grassroots schools for themselves and their children. Eventually, free public schools were established throughout the nation. And like every other American institute, the schools were racially segregated and differently funded. Pass, fast forward to May of 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education. The landmark case in American education declared segregated schools as un constitutional. According to the Supreme Court Chief Justice Warren, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. So it took 90 years after slavery supposedly ended for the highest court in the nation to declare it okay for Black students to be educated in the same physical space as white students. But the legislators in the state disagreed with the South Carolina, South Carolinans and passed a collection of laws to respond to the Brown decision. Make no mistake, these laws were intended to prevent school integration. For instance, in 1954, Virginia, a pol in Virginia, a policy called massive resistance was advocated for by a conservative Democrat from Virginia, U.S. Senator Henry Byrd. The doctrine included a law that published any Virginia school, that punished any Virginia school, that integrated by eliminating its state funds 
and eventually closing the school. In August 1954, Virginia Governor Thomas Brandon Stanley created a commission to conspire a defree, def oh, to conspire to defree Brown. The Great Commission held that school attendance should be a should be compulsory. Money should be allotted to parents in tuition grants if they opposed integration and authorized local school boards to assign students to schools themselves. And for those individual citizens who supported integration of public schools, they were met with economic and social reprisals. Character assassination, loss of business, patients, etc. But the retaliation against individual supporters paled in comparison to what was done by the local governments. For example, after one district was ordered by the court to integrate in May of, 2000, of 1959, officials in Prince, Prince Edward County, Virginia, simply closed its entire school system instead and remained closed for five years. In other words, no school is better than integrated school. In 1956, 101 of 128 Southern congressional signed the Southern Manifesto announcing the Brown decision, denouncing the Brown decision and urging Southerners to exhaust all law means, all lawful means to insist the chaos and confusion that would result from school desegregation. In addition to legal and legislative resistance, the white population of the South, of the Southern United States, mobilized to nullify the Brown decision. In states across the South, whites set up private academics to educate their children, at first using public funds to support the attendance of their children in their segregated facilities until the use of public funds was successfully challenged in court. In other instances, segrega segregationists terrorized and intimidated Black, family, Black families with threats and violence. We cannot have this discussion without talking about Little, the Little Rock Nine. Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. They were the first African-American students to enter Little Rock Central High School. The response to the presence of the Little Rock Nine was so violent that President Eisenhower felt compelled to call the National Guard. This was the, uh, where am I at? I'm sorry, of terrorism in action and not democracy. We also couldn't have this decision, this discussion without talking about Ruby Bridges being escorted by marshals. On the first day in her new school, Ruby and her mother arrived with four US marshals for protection. Ruby saw a massive crowd of people shouting, throwing things and carrying signs as she approached the school. Ruby was so young and innocent. She thought it was the Mardi Gras. As soon as Ruby entered Wilm France Elementary, white families took their children out of the school. On the second day, a white girl broke the boycott and entered the school. After a few days, other white parents began bringing their children back to school and the process, the, pro, the protest subsided. However, only one teacher, Barbara Henry, was willing to teach Ruby for the remainder of the school year. Ruby was in a classroom by herself and Mrs. Henry. Ruby was tormented routinely on her way to school. One woman threatened to poison her and another showed up in a black doll, with a black doll in a wooden coffin. The federal marshals held an 
the federal Martians had to escort her to the restroom to keep her safe. One of the marshals assigned to Ruby Charles Burks proudly said later that he showed a lot of courage, that she showed a lot of courage. She never cried or whimpered, Burks said. She just marched along like a little soldier. What struck me is that white America fought hard just so their children could not have to sit next to a black student in a classroom. They fought so hard and subjected a six-year-old little girl to such terror that she had to be soldiered. The effects of Ruby's bravery took a toll on the Bridge family. Her father lost his job as the gas station and the supermarket and the grocery store where they shopped banned them from returning. And the farm owners sent Ruby's grandparents from the farm. They had sharecropped for over 25 years. So it literally cost white families nothing but to open a space in their hearts. But it cost the black family their entire livelihood just so that Ruby could have equal access to the same education as a white peer. And for those who want to say that was long ago, here's a picture of Ruby five years ago at her graduation in Trenton. At a graduation, at a graduation in Trenton. Ruby, when the school board in Manfield, Texas admitted 12 students to an all white Manfield High School, white students took to the street to protest. On August 30th, 1956, the first day of school, mobs or white pro um, I'm tired, <laughs> sorry. Um, Segmentist patrolled the streets with guns and other weapons to prevent black children from registering. The mob hung an African-American empty at the top of the school flag pole and set it on fire. Attached to each pants leg was a sign. One read, this nigger tried to enter a white school. That would, be, that would be a terrible way to die. And the other read, stay away in. And despite the South Carolina ordering the manifest school district to desegregate in 1956, it did not so until 1965. So despite risking livelihood, life and limb to get an education, despite South Carolina rulings that segregation be unconstitutional, despite subjecting our children to trauma and terrorism so that they can sit in the same room to learn as white students, despite the bravery of Ruby, public schools in America remain largely segregated today. According to According to a 19, I'm sorry, a 2019 report by a nonprofit, Ed Bill Moore study, and half study, more than half of US children attend schools in districts where the student population is either more than 75% white and more than 75% non white. And though we have spoken mostly about Southern schools, the North was no exception. In fact, today we sit here and we sit here and speak. New Jersey has one of the most segregated school systems in the country. I will hand it over to Caroline. So why did segregation fail? 
I searched and found many explanations, but I believe Carol Anderson's book, White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide, best summarized it. She highlights that the truth is that oppression, the truth is that opposition to black achievements is not just a Southern phenomenon. In the North, it, it has been an intense, just as intense, just as determined, and in some ways, just as destructive. She further shared that the, fruit, the truth is that when the Brown v. Board of Ed decision came down in 1954 and black children finally had a chance at a decent education, white authorities didn't see children striving for quality schools and an opportunity to fully contribute to society. They only saw a threat to the status quo and acted accordingly, shutting down schools, divesting public monies, uh, into private coffers and leaving millions of children's in, children in educational rot, willing to even undermine national security in the midst of a major crisis, all to ensure that Blacks did not advance. And this has not meaningfully changed. Only the discourse has been broadened. While racial segregation has been a glaring and publicly debated issue throughout our history, the issues of the issues of the needs and rights of LGBTQ and trans students are fairly new to the inclusion debate. Unfortunately, without affirmative action, history will almost always repeat itself. So the response to LGBTQIA and trans issues have been violent opposition and staunch resistance. Though today we don't have national guards escorting our kids into schools while parents violently protest outside, now, the parents are largely inside at school board meetings and violent protests are happening there. In some instances, the racist, anti-Semitic and or transphobic language is explicit. Simona, I'm gonna let you listen to um, a couple of quick clips from a video or several videos. No sound. Okay, here we go. No sound. No sound, Simone. Yeah, that would have helped. <laughs> Sorry, here you go. That's right. Okay. 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 There's a heated debate tonight among parents in the suburbs of Ann Arbor, Michigan over race and immigration, and it grew hotter after this meeting with school officials over what the school system says are racist comments posted on social media by classmates. Adrian Iroola is the father of two former students. He was speaking about racism directed at his children when the meeting went south. When I went to his bedroom to say goodnight and he was crying because of the abuse that he was enduring in this school system. And why did you stay in Mexico? <laughs> The school district is predominantly white, and Tom Bertel, the parent who interrupted, was defending students who made the posts. Try being white and walk in a black neighborhood, see what happens, you know? And like these, uh, this incident where somebody made a little tweet, and nobody was hurting that, you know? That, nobody got hurt, and that was done off, off campus. This man is a father of a son who's on the receiving end of the racial slurs that got everyone here. My son comes to school every day trying to get an education, but he has to deal with that BS. Iraola came to this country four decades ago and now owns three Mexican restaurants. Here's another video. Ah, she trying. Okay. This is my PowerPoint presentation. Stop.
You could stop that one. No, Simona, because it's not working well. Play the other one from New Jersey, please. Father, we declare and decree that your will will be done. Christian parents prayed and protested before the State Board of Education against a law requiring public school students to learn about LGBTQ history and cultural contributions. The controversial new curriculum kicks in this coming September across New Jersey. We don't want our children forced to be taught things that go against what we believe as Christians. The teachings of uh, Jesus Christ are that we are to uphold what the biblical principles say about one man being married to one woman. Though I have no animosity and no hostility towards anybody who should practice this lifestyle, I feel that it is not fair or right or just for the curriculum to be taught in such a way to label people with my religious convictions as bigots because we are not bigots. This is going to have a detrimental effect on kids. How? How? Because what they're doing is they're introducing an alternate lifestyle. Now, once you, the way this is worded, um, it's opening Pandora's box. So you have this now put within the state curriculum for students to not simply learn about, but to adopt as their own. Opponents claim the curriculum drives an agenda, but Garden State Equality, which helped design sample lesson plans in the curriculum, denies that. Fear um, and the unknown is what, you know, drives um, sometimes folks' inability to understand certain topics or um, discussion points. And we just want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to learn um, some basic information about the LGBTQ community. Lesson plans include teaching middle and high school kids about Nazis making gay concentration camp prisoners wear pink triangles, a biography of someone forced to undergo gay conversion therapy, and different pronouns used by gender-fluid people. The curriculum's interwoven across different subjects from language to social studies. We are not expecting educators to simply um, add an additional lesson or an additional unit, but to include um, the folks who have who've been in this community and not been talked about or seen. Twelve schools got the sample curriculum yesterday. They'll pilot the lesson plans this semester. As Rumson superintendent explained, there's a lot of thoughtful decision making and exploration that needs to occur with our faculty and administration before lessons are rolled out to students. The state board does not write detailed lessons, but does vote on curriculum standards. Protesters want to postpone the implementation. And have hearings throughout all the counties of New Jersey so that everybody can express their views and not just a few. But that seems unlikely. Governor Murphy signed the law almost a year ago. This makes New Jersey only the second state after California to require an LGBTQ curriculum, and the law's got no mechanism for the state to monitor school compliance. In Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, as you can see, um, oftentimes the language is explicit um, that's used, and other times it's more nuanced. But what is clear is that any discussion that attempts to center equality and protection of students who are not white or who are differently abled or who are not heterosexual or who are not cisgendered or who are not Christian is deemed a threat to the feelings and safety of white, able-bodied, heterosexual, cisgendered Christian students. So in the past, the segregationist agendas were in large part infused with discussions on the loss of states' rights to make decisions about their local schools. Today, the new trick is to frame if you issues of equality and safety as the loss of parental rights over curriculum, school policies, and the education of their children. 
Discussions at school board meetings often reference conspiracies and woke agendas seeking to indoctrinate children, as you heard, and take away from learning, science, reading, writing, and math. And critical race theory is placed at the front and center of these discussions often. CRT has become, in a sense, the new Brown decision. It has become a flashpoint to continue to legitimize separate, separate and unequal treatments in schools. Detractors consistently describe it as a tool used to teach black children to hate white children and to deprive white children of their right to feel safe and secure in school. This of course engenders fear amongst white and white proximate parents. So once parents are convinced that they and the, that the curriculum is designed to put them and their children at risk of losing their comfort, then it's easy to convince them that that same curriculum also threatens their hetero and cisgendered privilege and their Christian beliefs. According to Forbes Magazine 2022 edition, most of the people who oppose CRT, they don't even know what it is. Critical race theory asserts that racism is embedded in US social institutions. Example, the criminal justice system, the education system, the labor market, the housing market, the healthcare system. And these systems shape, shape laws, regulation, rules, and procedures that ultimately give favor to whites and marginalized blacks. That's it. So while a good number of white Americans who oppose the theory rem remain unaware of what it is, they intuitively understand their resistance towards racial equity as they believe it is at the expense of losing racial power and privilege. But critical race theory does not attribute racism to white people as individuals or even to entire groups of people. Its theory is about systems, but it has become coded language for reducing white supremacy. Experts have pointed out that well-funded political think tanks are using critical race theory as a catch-all phrase to scare parents and to gin up activism against equity and inclusion initiatives. The real problem is that CRT is a theory that uses history to support its thesis. And that's pretty solid to support. <laughs> that's pretty hard to disprove. So instead of trying to disprove the theory, they've resorted to demonizing critical race theory, misrepresenting it and exaggerating its reach. For the record, critical race theory is not taught in public schools. It is a college level course. So consistent with a solution looking for a problem, eight states, including Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Iowa, New Hampshire, Arizona, and South Carolina have passed legislation to ban critical race theory. But except for Idaho, none of the state bills explicitly mention critical race theory. That said, Montana and South Dakota have denounced teaching concepts associated with CRT. In Florida and Georgia, Utah and Oklahoma, the state boards have introduced new guidelines barring CRT related discussions. Almost 20 other states have introduced or plan to introduce similar legislation. The bills, the bills ban discussing training or adopting the belief that the US is inherently racist and discussions about conscious and unconscious bias, privilege, discrimination and oppression. The core question here is, are we ready and willing to have the talk about how white supremacy shows up in our schools? We cannot continue to talk about equity without talking about the causes of inequity. We cannot say we want equity, but remain unwilling to do the work to uplift historically marginalized students. This issue of equity is one that's being grappled with nationally and here in Princeton. And we must head on answer, are we committed to an inclusive and meaningful education for all our kids in our community or just the ones 
who have been historically edu educated and cared for. An important part of tackling the issue must be the decoding of the language we use to talk about racial, religious, gender, and sexuality issues in our schools. We simply cannot be not racist. We must be anti-racist warriors. We must, we must become adept at recognizing coded language that's used to maintain oppressions, and we must not be afraid to call it out each and every time. I will now turn uh, the microphone over to Linda, who will wrap up the discussion with a few comments regarding equity issues here in Princeton. Thank you so much. I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. And I'm gonna apologize in advance. I have a new puppy who might participate. <laughs> Um, so this is a question that I think builds on um, the first presentation, and hopefully we can continue to discuss these questions um, with some focus on the Princeton Public Schools. Um, so how is racism against black and brown students present in our schools? Well, we do have some data related to Princeton. So I hope you can see this excerpt from the Princeton Public Schools Equity Audit uh, from just a few years ago, a couple of years before the pandemic began. And here there are some questions about a sense of belonging in the public school system in Princeton. The lowest scoring students were black, multiracial and indigenous American, Alaskan native students. They were least likely to agree with the question, my family feels safe, welcome and comfortable coming to school, 59%. The students who scored the highest were white students at 80% and Asian students at 72%. In addition, when the students were asked directly if they felt welcome and comfortable coming to school, um, this question actually is for the parents. The parents felt a little bit more welcome at 79%. Um, but still this was the lowest, these were the lowest ranking groups of the different subgroups that they analyzed. Multiracial parents and guardians were at 83%. When the students were asked directly, I am included and belong at my school, um, you see that gender non-conforming students, students who had selected other gender were least likely to agree along with indigenous American, Alaska native students. White, male and Asian students were most likely to agree. Since then, um, during the strategic planning process, the consultants that were used compiled an 88 page data booklet um, I didn't uh, quote from it because I wasn't sure if that was available only to uh, the members of the committee or not. Um, but when you go through the lengthy data report from surveys, it shows that black students also continue to feel um, the lowest levels of support and inclusion in the schools in Princeton. So there is some scholarship about why this continues to occur and the wealthiest schools um, in the country with high per pupil spending uh, that are racially integrated. Um, this book, despite the best intentions, how racial inequality thrives in great schools, um, relies on qualitative evidence using interviews and um, survey data to help explore this question. And one of the things that they emphasize is the role of prejudice. <laughs> so it's not just systemic racism, it's ongoing race-based status beliefs uh, that affect how the staff in the schools, the administrators, the teachers, and other parents um, react to uh, different groups of students within the schools. And this is explored with detailed interviews from uh, the scholars with parents, with teachers, and with many of the students in this school system. 
um, they kept the school system in this book anonymous. So just a few examples from this book. So here they're talking about disciplinary hearings before a discipline board. And they're noting that uh, the review board responds differently depending on really the race of the student. And some of it has to do with the advocacy of the parents. Um, when, and the privileged parents in the community, the most involved in this school district are white. Uh, when a white children is accused of wrongdoing at the school, typically the parents become very involved, argue, you know, you need to consider his future or her college admissions. But for black kids who are subject to discipline, white parents have a different reaction and um, advocate for stronger punishments, um, concerns about school safety and so on. The book goes into detail about which, you know, parents have more resources to hire a lawyer. So there are other dimensions to this as well. This quote from the book refers to um, just general expectations for student success. And um, here, this is um, a Latina mother who's responding to the interviewer that she feels that when white students um, enter a classroom or enter a school building, there are assumptions that there are good kids that will be um, good students in school, but students of color constantly have to prove themselves and they are aware of that. This is part of a chapter in the book about the consequences of tracking in the school district. So tracking is a phenomenon um, that most of us are probably familiar with, where you have honors level classes, or you might have accelerated classes in certain subjects um, with a lower level set of classes for students who might be perceived to be less academically capable. Um, the book goes into a lot of detail about the consequences of tracking um, and uh, explains that this is one of the major drivers along with disparities in discipline that produce the inequities in this particular school district. Um, and I like this set of quotes on this slide because um, they're showing that the tracking system in this school district results in enormous segregation within school buildings. So. In the prior presentation, you heard about, you know, um, the legacies of history. Well, today we have um, segregation within schools, even when the school population itself is fairly diverse. And so what explains this? Um, some of it is the race-based status beliefs uh, that are driving some of the pupil placement. But once you look into the resources that are provided to these different levels, you see that often the best teachers go to the honors classes. And so it becomes the system that perpetuates itself and reproduces advantages for the most privileged students who are typically white um, in this school district. And so the quote at the bottom of the page, I think is really important. It's from an African-American history teacher uh, who's talking more generally about the school. And she says, the new, newest teachers are given three classes for the lowest achieving students. Um, and you call that setting students up for success? That's not right. The students that are at the lowest level at the bottom of the gap, they need the best teachers in the school. Um, but that often doesn't happen. Princeton is not immune to discussions about tracking. Um, however, some of it is not fact-based. And I think this builds uh, from what um, Carolyn Clark was mentioning earlier. Um, often there's a fear-based reaction when there's discussions about strategic planning or a curriculum review. Um, and in this case, I think um, parents did respond to um, a consultant's report with vehement opposition about a plan that had not actually been proposed. So this article here is discussing that. 
um, the school district was thinking about adding some courses and parents began to you know, generate this outcry that calculus was going to be canceled. Um, I think because they were following discussions that had occurred in places like Fairfax, Virginia and California um, and maybe wanted to preempt something here, but it was definitely a, um, a, a very loud and angry discussion that probably delayed decision-making regarding how to help support students who um, experience the most um, difficulty with the pandemic. So it was unfortunate. And then um, also to pick up on the prior discussion, this is a good definition of what racial code words can do. Um, sometimes overt racist slurs are never used in discussions about uh, curriculum reform or strategic planning. And yet um, you, you can see underneath the surface that a lot of this is driven by discussions that are rooted in race-based status beliefs. Um, and it's not often acknowledged. So just to close and just hopefully to spur some discussion, I went through and did a code, code analysis of some of the public petitions that have circulated in recent months um, in the Princeton Public Schools about the high school, about tracking. And I picked some of the quotes that I had too many to include on one slide to show you how some of this more subtle coded language appears in our own school district. Um, and there are just many, many examples of this. Um, you know, this language is often used in reference to black uh, district leaders. Um, so that's something that is also worth mentioning. So I wanted to end with that slide just so we had some basis for a discussion to start the discussion about the Princeton Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline and Simona and Linda uh, for this really valuable information that you've shared and the um, the problems that 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 we have seen. But we would like to hear from people attending, particularly people who have uh, children in the schools currently or recently. Um, for me, one of the the issues, has been this idea of, of expectations and how is a parent to even um, ascertain that? And uh, another thing that occurs to me that I've heard um, students say once they get to high school or maybe even after they've graduated, that it's only in retrospect do they realize what they have experienced in terms of, of racial prejudice or other kinds of prejudice. So I'd like to put that out there and ask if anybody wants to share experiences or ask questions, or if any of our speakers wants to respond to, to what I, I've just said at the moment. Well, I'll, I'll just add that. <laughs> Um, oftentimes when you're in the situation, you don't realize the trauma. Um, I'm pretty sure that Ruby at six years old didn't realize her trauma. And, you know, it's only afterwards that when we reflect on things that we, we see it hindsight um, being 2020. So uh, it's not, I don't think it's unusual for our, and, and they just don't have the lens for our children to not realize when it's happening. But as they become more sophisticated, that doesn't mean that because we're realizing it afterwards that we don't feel the trauma. We still do. That trauma stays with you. Yes. But there, there are cases where the student does know 
And so I'll give an, a personal example. I attended Trenton Central High School in Trenton, New Jersey. I was in the 10th grade, first year in high school, and I sat near the window and I would always be looking at the window. The front of the building was always activity. And I was in English class and my teacher was white. And maybe the second week in class, she came to me and she said, Simona, um, I want to send you to another classroom because I think that you'll be, you'll be uh, uh, helped better there. And so I said, the first thing I said was, did you tell my mother? And she said, well, you can go down there and try it out. And if you don't like it, then you can come back up. So I said, okay, that was reasonable. When I went down here immediately, immediately, and I didn't have the language, I didn't have the understanding, none of the things I have today, but those children were obviously um, dealing with disabilities. It was blatant. I left the room, I came back up there and I said, no, I don't think that's right for me, but you don't have to tell my mother because I will be. But it did something for me because I realized she thought that or assumed it because I wasn't paying attention and answering her questions. I turned around and was raising my hand so much, I got on her nerves. But still for her to make that assumption was hurtful. And I still remember it to today. Thank Thanks, you. Simona. Um, I'm a retired school counselor. And I distinctly remember a little African-American girl coming into my very suburban school district that I retired from. And she was from Irvington. Irvington, Newark, dark complected, single mom, all right, you know, the, the fit the little stereotype of not being enough. Well, the reading teacher did her assessment and we did do some, I guess, kind of tracking because she ended up in the second grade, in the top second grade. Okay, I'll tell you this much. This second grade had more Asian students than white students. So it was like the top second grade. The little girl ended up in this particular teacher's class. Do you know this woman came to me and said, do you think the teacher made a mistake? She doesn't belong here. And my response was, well, it's a little bit racist, don't you think? I don't mean it that way. Yeah, you do. The little girl excelled in her classroom, but her assumption was she did not belong there. And I mean, I've seen that happen over and, and I'm talking elementary. So coming in at the gate, parents have to almost fight for their children to be in, and this is and this is a public school in the wonderful state of New Jersey. And I would always pull them aside and say, you gotta be your child's advocate. You have to make yourself present and you gotta be there to fight for them. I'll help you, but you gotta be there. But yeah, I mean it, the, the bias was was insane. And for boys, all the little active boys, well, I think he's got ADHD. <laughs> You know, the frustration with that. He can't sit still. Well, uh, most little boys don't sit still. You know, so I mean, it's, it's being inside the school and watching how the system tries to suppress the African-American or Latino child. It's, it's, it's just crazy. And we're, and this is, this is now, this isn't, this isn't then, you know, Simona did a great legacy of history and it's still prevalent. And that's the shocking thing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joyce. I, I just want to add a story, not back to the 50s, but a few years ago of a friend of mine in Princeton, uh, African-American, had to go into the high school for each of her children, her son and her daughter, to make sure that they were able to be in the honors classes that they were quite qualified for. And um, they're both highly successful professionals. Her son, who became a history professor, is a MacArthur fellow. 
<laughs> so it, it was it, it, that it, it's can be that that outrageous um uh, denise you've uh you put something in chat but i think it would be worthwhile if you would ask your question out loud and get the response yes hi everybody um thank you for this great presentation good to see simone and, and so many people who i haven't seen ruth I haven't seen in a while yeah i actually was shocked at the vitriol around uh, the dismissal of a principal who obviously had broken the rules and just driving around Hopewell and Princeton and seeing those signs and how people were so agitated. I listened to one of the school board meetings, probably two of them, and people were just off the hook on outrageously pointing their very spirited comments uh, against a very competent and reasonable superintendent um, who's been honored, you know, in all kinds of ways. And all she was doing was trying to make sure that the school had a competent principal at the high school helm. But it was very nasty. Um, and I didn't think that, that, you know, Princeton people behave like that, but they were off the hook and, and shockingly so. Um, it, I didn't think that was Princeton High School. It was quite, quite uh, offensive. And thank goodness uh, she was allowed to prevail. They were asking for her to be dismissed because she was executing her responsibility. And these, these people are at will. They know they're at will. And then that as a white male, for him to persist and bring this, you know, big circus around his dismissal when he deserved to be dismissed, period. You know, if I, I if the, if it was a a white superintendent and a black person, it would never have played out like that at all. Just so you know, I was just sitting there saying to myself, "In this something, in 2022, 2023, you know, I mean, I'm surprised the superintendent didn't just get up and say, "I'm later for you, you racist people. I'm getting up out of here." Thank you. I read recently. Also, that if you're concerned about the diversity of staff, it's clear that um, black superintendents and high level administrators are the ones who hire other staff of color. And uh, we we need that kind of representation. We need it for our children. I, I, it's a it's a personal concern for me. I have a, a, a seven year old uh, African American granddaughter in, in the Princeton school system. The population, the African American population of Princeton, is down to six percent from a couple of decades ago at twenty percent, and the school systems reflect that. African American representation in the Princeton schools is also six uh, percent. Linda, did you want to speak your your comment? Sure. I also wrote in the comments. Um, I did take. Um, some of the comments from a number of different uh, petitions that had circulated. Some had circulated several months prior to the dismissal of the non-tenured principal. Um, so some concerned uh, changes to the curriculum at the high school concerning science. Um, and then an, I think there was also a petition that was circulated about the math review um, and concerns about equity in general. So there were a number of different petitions that were circulating with this harsh uh, language, I felt. Um, so I didn't put her name in there just to spare the association, um, but uh, most of them were targeted to her, but there were also uh, vicious comments directed to um, primarily black uh, supervisors in the district um, as well. I recently attended a student achievement meeting, a committee of the Board of Education, and heard a presentation from the science supervisor, whom a number of you are familiar with, Dr. Joy Barnes Johnson, in which she is trying to extend a mentoring program down to the middle school to encourage students who might not have the self expectation of going into the sciences or the technology area. And what has been clear is that for students to, to encourage that interest is not simply to produce the highest level scientists. 
in the way industry is developing, we need people who have uh, an understanding and have studied science and um, in order to succeed at all levels um, in, in science and technology related jobs in the future. Okay, my brothers and sisters, your silence is deafening. <laughs> I know. It, no, it that, makes that, me want to talk. <laughs> I don't know where you got to go, but you need to dig deep and come up with <laughs> questions, suggestions, Michelle, calling it out. I mean, especially my, especially my folks who live in Princeton. Come on, you guys have been there forever. Right. We have Michelle as a comment. Thank you, Michelle. Um, what I'm curious about is how we can all support each other and the values that we hold as this upcoming school board election is coming up, because that is the hot issue. And I know that coded language will be used. And I think that we need to come together as a group to make sure to hold um, people accountable to what they say, and also to um, support candidates that um, believe that equity is real because um, there's a lot of a lot of people don't think that that's actually an issue still. So um, I'm I'm looking to see how we can come together um, as a group to to hold these uh, candidates um, accountable. Any yeah. suggestions? I um I hope I'm not speaking out of turn because it's not definite yet, but. Uh, I understand that uh, the parent group, Princeton Parents for Black Children, is trying to organize now a forum for board candidates, which will have a focus of equity. And stay tuned. As soon as we get the definite information, we'll, we'll uh, send it out through um, Not In Our Town channels. But uh, having a forum like that, where the questions are specifically aimed at the understanding and the attitudes of the candidates um, regarding equity issues, I think is critical. Would, what do you think, Michelle? Absolutely. I mean, I think the other thing that's interesting is that, you know, um, making sure that that the that when PPBC has that forum, that it's well attended by members of the, the community, because that's the other thing that um, there's a lot of people that need to know this information. And I just wanna make sure that it gets out. We'll share information about every forum we're aware of as soon as everything is tightened up. I, to date, I believe the two fora that are all candidate inclusive are um, League of Women Voters, organized and also the the various parent organizations <clears throat> um and i think it's just as important that folks bring equity uh concerns to the fore in those less focused conversations um i keep remembering um a little snippet of ruha benjamin talking to us years ago in which she shared the experience of writing about uh, underserved and overserved mm -hmm. students and how as she was typing in the phrase overserved oh, her spell check popped up like that's not a thing she got the the little squiggly red line like what overserved what does that mean underserved yes we get that but overserved um and i just you know i the, the students who are not well served by the schools as they are currently configured absolutely need us to stand up and speak out on their behalf. Um, and for sure that includes racially marginalized students, 
Um, it also, in my experience, includes students with a learning difference, um, other disabled students. If you want to just study music at the high school in Princeton, mm -hmm. you don't want to like be good enough to be in the jazz band that goes to Europe every year, but you just love music. Good luck to you. Um, so that's the, the pressure to sort of overachieve and to deliver at the very, the, the most intense level at the expense of giving students an environment in which they feel safe and seen and welcomed uh, is, is a palpable issue in the school system. Since we have uh, Crystal Scheivel on the the screen, uh, who, if I may say, represents the League of Women Voters and will be holding a, a, a forum for the Board of Education candidates, perhaps you can guide us in terms of if we want that kind of question asked, what should we Absolutely. do? Absolutely, you can send it now to our Gmail address, and I will then put it in the list of questions that I am collecting. And actually, I, I'm really pleased I already have at least six questions, and one of which does deal with equity. But if you have a better worded one, fine. And you email them to lwvprinceton at gmail.com. And then uh, it will be on the libraries. Uh, the, the, the forum itself will be Thursday, October 12th at 7.30 on the library's site. Mm. And you can also put questions in the um, Q&A, but I would recommend you do it earlier. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, I just wanted to say something about expectations because I worked in Trenton for 23 years in the high school with a special ed group. And it's funny, when you're a white teacher with all black students, your expectations are just as high as if it was all white students. You know, it's it's funny how you don't, once you're immersed, you don't make the differentiation. And even if white students are in there, you you forget how to make a differentiation. You just believe, or at least I did, that all of these students could achieve. Mm -hmm. And it may be because I was totally immersed. And that was different. You know, that was a hard, a hard battle for me to learn about. I mean, it wasn't an easy thing for me to adopt, but once once I was there, all of those kids deserved everything. And it may have been because they were all black. Uh, I saw Bob Carp's hand raised. Is that you have to unmute? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did have a thought, and it's really follows up on what Shelley said. Is we really, if you go out into the quote unquote real world, you really have to look at the success of people with what so called learning disabilities, reading disabilities, learning dyslexia and all sorts of things which put them on a different track. But it's actually having witnessed that with a son. It's a way, as I've been told, of understanding that you can't do everything and that you need to be able to work with other people to get anything done. And if you're caught up in this focus of immediate success, and this absolute necessity to attend one of the three uh, top Ivy schools and the three top uh, small colleges, or else it's a failure. Life is a failure. You you lose something. You lose something terrible. Now it's very hard to convince parents that when their expectations are built so highly, and we do live in Princeton, uh, <laughs> built so right. much about this immediate success, but in fact. In fact, I believe I am actually sure that the, the African American, Latino, and other non-white, or however you want to, and, and non-traditional, or will do very well if they get the emotional support and the education that they need here in Princeton. 
And it's our job to make sure that they go through that system with their emotional well-being intact. Because if they go out in the real world with a good education that we can provide them, plus the emotional well-being, I'm, I'm convinced that they will. They'll do well. Maybe by not the definition of the three IVs and the, the those other three, which are debatable. Uh, I appreciate uh, the statements to um, that support providing all kinds of opportunities for students to participate. At the same time, I've been concerned over the years with the arts program at, in the Princeton Public Schools, starting some years ago when I asked the arts supervisor if <laughs> students who took only instruction, instrumental instruction through the school system, if any of those students made it to the top level, jazz band and so forth. And he said, no. So what it said was that what was needed or what allowed that uh, of reaching that, that level of, of musical performance was outside instruction. I know that they have, at least he said that they have implemented some supports that bring students from the elementary schools, I believe, into the middle school or to the high school, and that there's some pairing. So they may be trying to, to put in some supports, but it is really hard. So if you have somebody, if you have a student who really not only has the talent, has the desire and the and has the expectation that she or he can can achieve, are the uh, is everything in place in the schools to allow them to to do that. And I'm not convinced that that's true. I mean, you even get a situation with the, with the instrumental practicing in the, at home. Does the student live in the kind of housing environment where they can practice and not be disturbing any number of people? Whereas in a very large house with many rooms, a student can have the place to to practice an instrument without without disturbing somebody. So it you know it gets down to the intersection of of needs, the educational needs, the housing needs, all of that, all those systemic things I believe intersect and um, need to be addressed. I'd like to comment on uh, what you just said, Linda. I had the opportunity, it was a number of years ago, um, maybe as many as 10, but uh, to be in Trenton and to hear the middle school jazz band um, at one of, the, one of the middle schools that was at least as dynamic and, and, um, and well prepared to perform as the middle school band um, and almost the high school band in Princeton. And I was blown away by this performance. And I asked the question afterwards, how many of you take private lessons? Because I knew that, that in Princeton, everyone in those <laughs> bands had to. And not a hand went up. So it was about the training that that teacher was providing internally. So it mm. is possible mm. to develop that sense of um, attaining excellence without um, that other expectation. Um, and it just, you know, just to, to, to recognize that and, and, you know, context, but um yeah. yeah. Thank you. And yeah. for those of you who don't know, Ronnie Reagan is a professional musician and, and music teacher. And Ronnie, if I hear that, <laughs> that the art supervisor is coming to one of these committee meetings, I'm going to let you know. 
Okay. I ask you to attend. And I'm there. No, I think another well, I'm sorry. I'll go that uh, both um, Bob and Shelly hit on it. I mean, if the teachers, you know, as a teacher myself, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to convey to your students that no matter where you come from, no matter how you choose to identify, I'm with you. I hear you. I see you. I understand you. Mm -hmm. And when teachers can do that, everyone, the schools and everyone can flourish. And oftentimes um, you come in with a mindset like you don't really belong here. If you're feeling that way about a particular student, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to blossom. They're just not going to blossom. So no matter, and that's, that's kind of my, my, I guess my own personal struggle with, um, with some educators is that you've got to you've got to take off your own blinders you've got to get connected with your biases figure out where they come from and do something with them set them aside if you're going to be an educator and you embrace that young person so that he or she can you know or ever, again however they choose to identify they can they can rise to their full potential. And I don't know right now off the top of my head how, how to begin to do that with with teachers and or administrators, but um, other than asking them outright, <laughs> you know, what are your prejudices? <laughs> and of course the lines they have none, but yeah, we all do. So that's where I am. Thank you. Well, I, yep. if I could respond to Joyce. Yes, please. Real quick before we stop. I mean, I think that some of the disruption of prejudice has to occur through relationships. And um, there are programs that are attempting to do this, even though they don't advertise themselves as being prejudice disruptors. Maybe they couldn't even sell this <laughs> in our current political climate. Um, but there's one program called BAR, Building Assets, Reducing Risks, that um, seems to be doing a great job um, and finding ways so that teachers know students well enough um, that they're not responding just with these race-based status beliefs. And, um, you know, this is a evidence-based program that's been studied with randomized controlled trials. And um, so it's producing outcomes that you'd want to see if you really care about equity. Um, so I've recommended this to the district and they've considered it, but haven't adopted oh, it. Yet. What was the name of that, Linda? It's called Bar Building Assets, Reducing Risks. So it's it. a whole program designed to get around this deficit-centered kind of approach to dealing with. Um, Excellent, issues. thank you. Is there a, a way then that people from the community can support uh, the district's adoption of that? Is there information I can send out that and and Yeah, I can, I can send you some great links and videos. Um, I thought about writing an op-ed at, at one mm. point about it, but I felt like at the very highest levels, people seem to be supportive. Um, so I haven't heard a no yet, but it just hasn't happened yet. And I wish it had happened three years ago. But. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, uh, Connie Alangavan has, has put it into the, put the website into the, into the chat, barrcenter.org. Thank you, Connie. Do our other presenters have uh, any comments that they would like to make? Kim, do we have any other uh, comments in the chat that we've missed? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, at this point, I want to first thank our three magnificent presenters, Carolyn Clark, Simona Brickers, Linda Dodd, for giving us such a stimulating program and encouraging, I would say, as well, as hard as some of the information was to, to listen to. And I'll turn the, uh, the program over to Shelley Krause to conclude. Thank you so much. Thanks again to this evening's presenters and to all of you for taking some time out of your evening to explore these um, interesting and 
long-standing topics. Uh, I want to let folks know that next month, Continuing Conversations will be gathering here again virtually on Monday, November 6th. We'll be hearing from Amber Rahman. Amber is an undergraduate student at Princeton University in the African American Studies Department. Her research focuses on assessing the uses of carceral and surveillance technologies within global systems of imperialism, policing, incarceration, and works uh, she works to build transnational solidarities. Uh, Amber is a research assistant in the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, which engages in abolitionist, abolitionist practices of utilizing data for justice. She is also a student organizer with Students for Prison Education, Abolition and Reform, or SPEAR, at Princeton University and the Princeton Community uh, Committee on Palestine. She, I believe that she's going to be focusing on a case study of carceral technology called Shot Spotter to highlight how U.S. empire functions both locally and globally. And she's a big advocate of making those kinds of connections. So um, we hope that you and your friends will consider joining us for that program. Um, additionally, the following night, so the night after our next Continuing Conversations, Tuesday, November 7th, is, of course, election night. So. You have 15 days. If you're not registered, you have until October 17th to become a registered voter in order to cast a ballot in this upcoming election. There is also an application for vote by mail ballot, which in New Jersey is available to anyone. You don't have to make a case for it. You don't have to say, I'm going to be out of town. You can simply prefer to vote by mail. Uh, and that uh, any registered voter can fill that out. And that needs to be filled out uh, that's that's a later deadline, um, and you can ask to have that be your default setting, or you can say just this once. I'm going to vote by mail. Um, we, have in, we have early in-person voting in New Jersey now as well. That goes from October 28th to November 5th, so essentially the week leading up to the uh, polls. And those hours are 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday, and from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Sunday. So for those of you for whom election day you know is not going to work, but you like to do it in person, there's a nice window of opportunity there. And then the election itself is Tuesday, November 7th. Polls in New Jersey are open from 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. If you are in line by 8 p.m. you and you stay in line, you will be permitted to cast your ballot. So lots of opportunities. And we're not in our town. We'll make sure that folks are aware of the the forums that are available to connect with candidates. Um, please make sure that you're a registered voter and that you are a voter. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>